Uh, we're going to spend the first 20 or so minutes here going through some, uh, some key questions that will give you an understanding of the environments that they're dealing with. And then we're going to open it up to you uh, to ask questions um, of them. So to get started, would you mind each just introducing yourselves, just who you are, where you work, and give a sense of what you're doing with puppets so that people have a baseline understanding. Sure. My name is Elise Salberg. I'm a senior tech expert for Unix engineering at Putnam Investments in Boston. Um, we started working with Puppet um, about a year ago. I, um, I came to my first Puppet Conf right after I took my fundamentals training, and we've been working with it heavily for the past year. And I am our Puppet master, so I was the one to evaluate products, choose Puppet, and then um, work on the implementation. Um, we have about 1,500 servers, um, about 60, 40 Red Hat to Windows. Um, and we are continuing to expand. We've been working on the OS layer and integrating with our operations team. And we're going to be rolling out more application integration in the near future. So the application orchestrator is actually very exciting to, um, to see the development there. I know our middleware and application teams are very, going to be very excited about that. So that's pretty much where we are. Fantastic. Hi, folks. My name is Peter Magne. I'm a director of infrastructure services in FINRA. So we are a financial industry regulatory authority. So our mission is to protect guys like you, investors, uh, from potential market abuses. So we have about 1,000 Linux nodes that um, are running on Puppet. And for the last three years, we've been using it for on-premise environment. And within the last 18 months, we decided also to move Venture out to AWS. So Puppet is also helping us in our AWS workloads. I'm uh, Jez Miller. Uh, senior Infrastructure Architect for Heartland Payment Systems, a $2 billion financial company, uh, largest credit card, comp credit card processor uh, other than the big name banks that you know about. Um, I'm on my second iteration of a, of a puppet rollout. Uh, originally did a smaller company, a uh, team of 10 or so with two or 300 uh, operating systems, and we fully puppetized our stack um, to the point where we were not logging into servers anymore. We were tr doing nothing but commits to source code. Um, and now I'm working for the company that acquired us and helping uh, that infrastructure team implement Puppet enterprise-wide. So we've got about 15 different platform teams that these uh, sysadmins support and trying to drive standardization across thousands of VMs that do many, many different things. Sounds like fun. Yeah. <laughs> so so far. Let's, let's give everyone here just a sense of the before and after. Uh, can you talk uh, here for a second about what was life like before uh, bringing in automation, and then what have you seen so far in, in terms of how's it how's it changed day to day? Um, well, I actually I haven't seen as much before as I'm sure a number of the other people at my company, but we um, were using Blade Logic um, prior to implementing Puppet, so we're moving from a more job oriented um, infrastructure where instead of maintaining configuration over time, you're basically pushing out a configuration at a point in time to, to servers and then not really paying attention to whether it changes or not after that. Um, it's really a big cultural change um, across all the groups to be looking at something like Puppet um, where you're really talking about, um, and when I say compliance, I don't mean the starters compliance that FINRA is talking about, but the, the compliance with configuration. Um, that itself is a big change. Um, version control is a big change. Um, so really we're moving from a sort of stable state where things were working and people were fairly happy, but there was a lot of manual intervention. A lot of things took a lot of time. Things were very slow. Trying to move into a more quicker, into a, in a more quickly paced environment, a more DevOps environment, is actually um, something we're still, you know, working on very slowly. For us, it's um, since we are a um, regulatory institution, um, IT compliance is um, is topmost in our um, mindset. So. Um, before Puppet, our IT compliance scores for our organization, um, as, as reviewed by our information security team, hovered around the 60% compliance. After Puppet, um, we are now at the 90% compliance. Of course, information security, the threat landscape changes, but you know we're, we're in a better position um, at, from an IT compliance standpoint after Puppet. Uh, for us, the big wins uh, have been in speed and consistency. Uh, the uh, before we started rolling Puppet out, you know, a Java upgrade on an individual VM would take an hour or so. You'd have to get the bits over, do some config work, symlinks, all that kind of stuff. And so 
for us, a Java upgrade was a huge project. It would take hours and hours to get all the machines up, and we have to deal with syncing and phasing and all of that. And so it was that whole dev would be like, hey, we've run the unit tests all these. We've figured this out. This out. When can you get the Java uh, libraries updated? And um, you know, we're like, oh, it's going to take a week. And they're like, a week? It's like, well, we've got two guys that are going to iterate on this for hours and hours over the next week. And um, you know, with Puppet, once we got it instrumented, the Java library change was a couple lines of code, a package, go. And so we you know, took that down to as soon as the bits are there, we're done with the, whole, the entire environment. So um, you know, we to totally turned that around from the dev waiting on ops to ops going done in 10 minutes. When's your next Java ref? And uh, you know, that fundamentally allowed us to move forward. Um, we also, uh, because we're a PCI compliant uh, organization, we have the same you know, standards of, of ensuring that configurations are present across all the systems and audited uh, as such. And so when PCI auditors come around and, and uh, are asking, like, OK, let's look at this config. Uh, let's look at this one. And then we find something that um, is out of variance. Um, you know, these are, we had a slew of machines that had been managed by hand that just simply got overlooked um, as, you know, as from someone's checklist. Um, as we were rolling out Puppet in the enterprise, we were able to turn that around. And um, again, it was you know, one of those NTP configs, permissions sort of things. You know, so if you're logging into every box and doing you know, chmod and all that kind of stuff, it's, it's a time consuming uh, operation. Whereas you throw an agent on everything, you, throw, you get the config out there, and you fix 300 machines in about 45 minutes. And uh, you know, the regulators, before the regulator can even write down that you've got a violation, you've already addressed the issue. And that fundamentally changes uh, you know, our compliance picture. So as you set out to start automating with Puppet, how did you prioritize what to focus on? Is it you know, greenfield, brownfield? Were there certain types of servers, certain problem services? What, how, how did you decide what to do? Um, we, we prioritized getting the agent out first. Um, we wanted to be able to identify our inventory. That was something that when I came into the company, I was very surprised. It was difficult to identify. People would say, how many Windows servers do we have? And it's like, well, we can search through our, um, we can search through our um, CMDB, and, and, but it, w it took time. It took a lot of time. Um, so the first thing I wanted to do was get out the puppet agent everywhere so that we could have a better view of the inventory. Um, after that, for configuration, we definitely prioritize Greenfield. Um, we actually, at this point, may or may not actually fully manage our Brownfield. We, as those servers get replaced, they will have our full Puppet configuration. But um, currently, we have our Brownfields with a stripped-down configuration, um, just because of the amount of time it would take to get buy-in to switch every single one of those to a um, to a managed configuration. So basically, we prioritized um, inventory information, and then we prioritized getting configuration for new servers. Um, and we're probably going to keep moving forward so that we can have all our new servers be even even better instead of putting time into the brownfield. For us, we were lucky. We were able to do brownfield first compliance, and then we made the decision to go Amazon. So we used Puppet as a means to jump starting applications in, in the cloud. So. Uh, an added benefit was we were able to reuse a lot of the modules. So a lot of the compliance modules that we wrote for on-premises, we were able to rapidly deploy it in Amazon. And then the um, orchestration or application stack provisioning that we learned in Amazon using tags, we were able to also bring that back on-premises. So we had the best of both worlds. So it was cool. Uh, for us, it w it's been uh, mostly Brownfield and whatever, again, buys us the most time. Um, it's, it's difficult to sit down with a team when you're looking at thousands and thousands of servers and say, OK, we're going to puppetize every element of the stack all the way up from the OS to the runtime configs for every environment and all their variables. Um, but if you start picking the pieces, what, what do you spend the most of your time logging into boxes and messing with on a weekly basis and, and tracking that and say, OK, puppetize that first. Make, you know, do that so that becomes a very simple operation. And then you do some math. You're like, OK, if I did this, I just saved myself 30 hours you know, this week. Then that's now 30 hours that you can reinvest into doing some of the other things that you need to get ahead of and going to the next element of the stack. So that you, uh, you're, you're basically buying yourself time as you start automating those big pieces, the big uh, pains in the butts that, uh, that, that can sink a team with uh, you know, trivial tasks. So one of the things that we've talked quite a bit about today uh, is that 
doing any sort of uh, automation requires a shift in culture. Uh, so how did you convince your teams, or how are you convincing your teams um, and other teams to, you know, to buy into this crazy idea of automation? I mean, the, the biggest thing is, as was stated, time. Time is huge, especially when you're talking about installs or, or upgrades or things like that. That's the biggest opportunity that I've had to be able to add to the puppet code. So somebody comes and says, I need to install this stack on a server. And I say, great, we already have a profile for that but I need to make those servers fully managed. How many servers do you have? I have 10 servers. Okay, we'll go ahead and do that. And usually it's actually not that big a deal to get them fully managed. Our servers are actually surprisingly non-drifty um, for, for servers that are not actually in configuration um, management um, because we're, we're a fairly locked down environment, but it's great to be able to get them in there so we know for sure what's going on. Um, so that's the best way that I've been able to get, get people to say that you know normally it would take, you know, hours potentially to install it and then make sure it's in compliance and then it's probably not actually the same standard as your other servers. This way it's all standardized. Um, the hardest thing is when it's little things like operations saying I want to update a host name and I'm like please put that into Puppet. <laughs> like I don't want to put it into Puppet. It's a single line on a single server that I can just update. It's like please put it in there because when they migrate you'll need to know that they want the host name um, or you'll need to know that, that they have um, you know, a network alias. You don't want to miss that when, when we actually, you know, migrate the server to AWS if we go there in another year or something like that. So, so that's the hard. The little things that don't take any time, it's hard to tell them that putting into, into version control makes any sense, but we're working on it. Yeah, I think culture is, is, is important. I think um, like any large IT shops, you have old school folks and new school folks, people who like to try new things and people who say this works and we're going to stay with it. Um, the, the, the people who have the institutional knowledge are the old school. So your challenge is to try to, um, for them to document that into a puppet module, which they can share with the rest of the new school stuff, uh, uh, folks, and then have the rest of the team collaborate on that code and make it even better. And then take that to another um, level by, by putting it on the cloud. So, um, so, so change is hard. and, and it doesn't happen overnight, so you just have to keep at it. And you need to, to bring in um, people who really believe in changing, uh, in, um, bringing in new tools and processes, and are not afraid to fail. So if you had to hire different, a different profile of individual to, to do that, when you say bring in new people? We did, so we were lucky. So like any large IT shops, you will um, go through some um, natural attrition. And so when, when you have that natural attrition, you try to bring in new people who who are in line with where you want the, your, your team to be. Yeah, uh, the process that, that I've seen work really well is, you know, first you gotta evan evangelize those benefits and say, you know, really sell someone, because it is fundamentally different work, right? Uh, going to a sysad sysadmin team and saying, uh, the first thing you're gonna learn is a source control repository. And, and that, that's like, for a lot of sysadmins, you might have been spent 20 years in the industry and have, never even done anything other than maybe run a Git repository or Subversion or CVS, depending how long you've been in the industry, or Clearcase and um, going back. Uh, the, so getting some of those sort of basic things. That we, you know, we've got a guy on the team who's actually here at this, this conference who the first time he saw Puppet code was, I'm not a coder. I'm not an engineer. I, you know, I'm a sysadmin. This is, I make servers work. Um, so part of it is evangelizing and, and getting them to understand um, the benefits. And, and, Almost every company has a handful of people that are like willing to try anything, will run anything, just really want the tools and go. And I think that the, the success that we've seen is, is trying to do that, um, foster that grassroots mentality. For, you know, we're trying to do an enterprise top-down driving of this, of this rollout, uh, but putting it in the hands of the people that are chomping at the bit to get moving and just like, give me the tools, get me get going, because they're gonna start doing the quick wins and they're gonna start showing the other people that they work with. And so, you know, our group of people that are working on this grew really quickly just from a lot of that collaboration of, um, oh, I, you're using this and you did that, you like made this work this way in this little time. And, and so you get the people that have that personal incentives and then you can start incentivizing other groups to do the same thing. You know, so if you've got someone who's sitting there been doing things, the same, excuse me, doing things the same way for 20 years, and showing them that some junior admin that's been with the company for two years can do their job more accurately and faster than they can, 
you know, that you, you build that competition in, internally and you'll see people start to come around and that collective value people start to understand. Um, and then the other thing that, that, that's difficult from a, a culture standpoint is all the ancillary ways that uh, managing your systems that way uh, affects the whole company. So change control, you know, security, audit. Um, when, you know, when you go from sitting with an auditor who's looking at a server log and you've got this documentation in a server log of who logged in when and you've got, you know, or who made what change and um, you just change that to here's the diffs in the repository, here's the log that when th the bits got pushed, what else do you need to see? And the auditor says, looks great and, and moves on. So um, really trying to see the benefit, not only the sysadmins themselves, but everybody that works with us and works within operations and really seeing the value of giving us time to, to build that out and spread that out and, and make that, uh, you know, bring it across multiple platforms and not just the, the small team that started with it. So you talked about the reaction of someone on your team saying, hey, look, I, you know, I'm not a coder. Uh, you know, clearly, adopting Puppet requires learning some new skills. How have you tackled uh, the need to train people in new skills and in new ways of thinking? Um, well, we're trying to do knowledge transfers, and um, so I just did a couple before I came out here, and I will just basically make myself available after that. So they actually have to try it. I think a lot of times when you're doing, if you're doing like presentations or, or things in front of mul multitudes of people, then you don't, they, they'll be like, okay, fine, I got it, but until they actually start using it. And then they're going to come to you with questions, so you need to be available after that as well. Um, but I think it's sort of, it's a slow process. So first, w the way I look at it, at first I start with Hira and I look at data and I'm like, look at this file. It's a key value pair. It's just, you know, um, something you're trying to set and the setting for it. And they're like, oh yeah, that doesn't look so bad. And then you sort of move up a little bit and like, okay, now here's what Puppet looks like. And you're not going to be writing too much of this code to start, but you can use my code and, and, you know, so they see it and then they get used to it over time. I've actually found the biggest stepping stone for us is Git. Um, learning how to use Git. Like this is how you clone and this is where the repository is and this is how you check it in and they're like, what are all these commands? It's like, why do I have to do all this? And like, you know, that's actually harder, I think, than the puppet code itself. Puppet code's not that bad. Ruby, Ruby's another story. <laughs> puppet code is not that bad. So, um, but yeah, I'd say um, once you get past the first hurdles, I've mostly seen people run with it, which is pretty cool. I like that. Peter, how about you? Yeah, for us, when we signed our license agreement, we, we signed up for on-site training. So um, we had, I think it was 14 or 15 slots. So I invited representatives from each of the infrastructure teams. So we had a big data team. We had a um, data warehouse team. We had an Oracle team, et cetera. And then um, people who, who believed in Puppet in their respective teams, and then we used that as a train-the-trainer approach. And then we, we continue that after the initial training to have a weekly meeting, just like a community of practice, for them to take back to their respective teams. So I think somehow that has been mildly successful, and so we've, we've expanded our um, module developers in our, in our teams. Uh, we also did a uh, immersion training for about 10 or 15 people. Um, we knew that we had a handful of people that really wanted to get going, and then we had identified some other people we really sort of wanted to push along. And, some of them took and some of them didn't. Um, the, but it was valuable, at least gave people the foundation. It, it gave them that introduction to what's possible. Um, and really what we found out was, was getting the people who were using it, um, there are several people that was like a lead from one team and a lead from another team and a lead from another team and getting them collaborating across each other. So it had um, the dual benefits of, of knowledge sharing but also working across teams. Um, and so you know, we created an internal puppet user groups list uh, and then they started having regular meetings weekly, and I think they're doing them twice weekly, and really just going, hey, here's what I did, here's the problem I tried to solve, what's, you know, this, and that's been growing um, over time as more and more people uh, have caught on. So we just basically publicize and say, hey, you're interested in Puppet? We're meeting weekly, come hang out. Um, and really, for a company of our size, you know, we've got 5,000 some employees, it gives a sense of a small, cool company to a large company. We've got you know, a group of 12 or 15 people who are now leading the charge and doing a, you know, a lot of really great things and pushing the company forward um, and, and building that community and, and building that, that, you know, that, that thing that makes being a sysadmin fun, like check out this cool thing I did, this thing used to suck, now it's not even an issue we don't even think about, on to the next thing, let's go. And so it gets people out of that um, being a tech mindset and being system engineers. And the more people like that you have in your company, the better. Fantastic. 
So let's shift here for a minute and open it up, let you ask questions. So what are you curious about? No questions come up. <laughs> this is unbelievable. <laughs> yes. I, I missed yeah. a bit of that. I'm sorry. So you, did you look at other DevOps tools like Chef? Yeah, I, I, can, I can answer that. So the short answer is yes. So part of our decision to go with Puppet, the most important thing was the rationale for, for deciding on Puppet. And we had to explain it to our, to our technology team. So we are an infrastructure shop. We are sysadmins. So I felt that Puppet had, a, had an easier entry to moving us from sysadmins to infrastructure code developers. I think the learning curve for Chef was a little bit higher and steeper, so that's why we decided to go with Puppet. Yeah. We looked at two other competitors' tools, um, and I will say one of the things that really struck us about Puppet was the great community, like PuppetConf and just talking to people and everything. That, that was definitely one of the, one of the deciding points um, for us. It was a leap. We're used to enterprise-level software, so one of the things that was important was the, the strength of the software company and its community and, and everything like that. So um, for a, an open source, initially-based company, um, that, that, was, that was a leap for us. Yeah, we started with Puppet mostly because we, that's what I had experience with as a, as a director of operations for that other division. And at the time, Puppet was way more mature than Chef, and so the, the decision was natural. Um, we're in an interesting situation. We have a, another business unit on the other side of the country that's also using Chef. Um, and the person who's running that, um, you know, we, we've had that internal discussion. Should we standardize on one or should we not? And, and to echo one of the other, um, uh, Terry from Raytheon, uh, you know, she had a really great point where it's, um, it's more important to address the people who aren't automating than it is to worry about tool battles within your company because that's where your big problems uh, gr areas are going to be if you're trying to run a shop. So, you know, for us, you know, there, there's natural benefits to standardizing on a tool, you know, from an enterprise view for anything, but really, it's it's get out of your way, start taking care of things, and, and uh, you know, it's all of those attendant problems that come from manual administration, get those out of your way, and then you can have a tool fight down the line when. Every, if, you know, if we got to a point where everything was either Chef or Puppet, we'd be really happy and we'd be better off. And we'll, we'll, you know, we can have some religious war fight down the line, um, but right now it's let's, let's get the things going. Let's start automating, because doing things by hand is just ridiculous at this point. Yes? Um, yeah, so that's an interesting thing because that you, when you bring in virtualization layers that have different facilities for turning up resources and things, it, it's, we haven't necessarily solved that problem ideally. Uh, you know, we don't have a hard and fast solution. It's one of those things that I think um, is useful to figure out where you're most comfortable drawing the line, where what tool brings you the best configuration management, say, elements of the stack versus provisioning, and really break it down to the function of the, of the tools and figuring out where that, where that delineation is and what expertise you have in-house and what has worked and what hasn't. I've seen people that want to throw out uh, or will use Puppet to do all the pr provisioning in a virtualization stack. Other people use the provisioning with the stack, but then the first thing that comes up in uh, any provisioned uh, OS is uh, Puppet Agent. Um, so I think it really matters most is what the skill set of your team is, what tools you're comfortable with. Um, if it's Greenfield, then yeah, you've got a bigger pool to, to choose from, but again, Puppet sort of does a little everything, so it does make it, make it um, easy. But the important thing is to, is to really get to that element where, where to keep driving towards that you have the full stack automated in some tool with some centralized visibility. Um, because without that, you, you don't have the full picture and you're, and you're really limiting yourself. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'll just add that I find that when provisioning, even whether it's virtualized or not, 
Um, provisioning the minimal that you can to bring it up and then handling the rest with configuration management is generally better because if you start using golden images and things like that for VMs, you're going to get out of date and you're going to have somebody say, we need to change the NTP servers. And you're like, now I need to change it on the golden image and I need to change it in Puppet. And it's like, why bother changing it on the golden image? Just set it in Puppet. Um, when you start getting into disposable infrastructure like Docker, AWS, then, then that becomes interesting. Do you just use Puppet to bring it up and then not manage it? Or do you keep managing it is one of the things that we're trying to figure out. I know you can do it either way. So that, I think, is when you get to um, in to the, the types of very lightweight infrastructure where you're not even maintaining it, you're just going to blow it away and build a new one. Um, that line gets kind of blurry. Yeah, for us, we had that, um, that, that challenge when we went to AWS. So there was a concept of a thin AMI or a fat AMI, so basically an AMI that held all the things in it. So in the end, we decided to go with the thin AMI, just the bare OS with Puppet Agent, and then allowed the app teams to layer on whatever else they needed. So that may change down the road, but uh, for us, um, starting with the bare minimum, putting a Puppet Agent there, and then letting Puppet do its work is, works for us. And, and to come back to that, if you don't mind, is, is we saw the flexibility of this pretty early on after we got acquired. That was one of the things that we used to show the executive staff at the larger company where we had a uh, physical infrastructure that was containerized, it was Solaris, um, and we were migrating a data center. And we realized that we, we didn't want to, we wanted to go virtual, but because we had already puppetized the stack, we, made, we basically said, let's just spin up a new data center in the virtual data center. We've already got the puppet code, so we just pointed the puppet master over, said rebuild all of these, and then we sold those servers on eBay, and that was the easiest data center I've ever moved. Yeah. That was easy. <laughs> <laughs> Do we have a question right here? Yes. Um, I was wondering, um, did you, when you first uh, launched your puppet versions of your uh, infrastructure, did, the, did you already have um, uh, testing uh, on that for safety, or did you just launch in a bare bones configuration and retrofit? Oh, they're all looking at me. Um, we actually, one of the things I'm here to work on is our testing infrastructure. And um, I would say that's probably the second hardest thing for us to figure out besides the initial rollout. Um, and we had help with that. We, had, we did have ProServe come out um, and help us just get everything kickstarted, which was great. I, if anybody hasn't started with Puppet and goes with Puppet, I highly recommend it. Not just because our sales rep is standing right there. So, um, but no, it was it was exceedingly helpful. Um, and um, but the testing infrastructure, obviously, there wasn't time to do that. And so, um, so that that's definitely our our second biggest str struggle. We do a lot of testing by hand currently, um, and we do a lot of um, sort of canary rollouts. So we're we're pretty sure about that. But as we expand to more applications, that's going to be a lot harder to to manage. So we're going to need continuous integration. For us, we we have. A puppet master for dev, a puppet master for QA, puppet master for production. So we had to manually ro um, promote the code. Um, and it, it's a work in progress for us, but now we're introducing Jenkins um, jobs, but it's, it's bare minimal. It's just making sure that there are no syntax errors, et cetera. So it's a step forward, um, and there's a long way to go, but, but we, we did have testing, um, but now we're trying to take it to the next level. Yeah, same thing. Uh, d depending on whether we're going greenfield or brownfield, uh, you know, a lot of the brownfield systems have been running in production for years. So uh, th they, you know, so provisioning, there wasn't any concept of infrastructure validation uh, for those systems. Uh, so our par part of our process was, again, either phasing it um, with, with multiple masters in different environments, uh, but some of it was just building trust in the tool that, um, you know, if you do have a legacy brownfield tool and you're, and you're trying to, f to figure out you know, is that safe or not? Well, how safe is it to go manually and change 100 servers? You know, if you, if you really get the foundation, you're like, I can guarantee this, um, that, that this configuration, this setup is there, then, then you have that trust in the tool. You're like, just get that there. Now you've got some baseline. And so you've incrementally built a baseline that you can work against. So if you are doing something big with that brownfield environment, you, you can now do something with it. It's not just this big, weird archaeology stack of garbage. It's, it's a, uh, you know, something that's well-defined and clearly known so that you can make some smarter decisions about how you work with that. 
but yeah, to your point, being able to unit test infrastructure is amazing, and it's it's that's you can't do that unless your infrastructure is code. Question right here. Um, so. Yeah, I can speak to that. So um, I can say that when we started, we, very ha we had a small base of users, so it was very easy to make those changes. Um, recently, we did an upgrade from, and you change your versioning, but from 3.1 three, three to 3.8. So, mm -hmm. so it, was, it was significant um, for us. The, one, the two things that came out was um, a lot of people were pushing back on the change, like, OK, wh why do you have to do it? The second is they, they want the downtime to be as, as minimal as possible, um, which is a good thing because you know, that means there are more people that, are, that care about Puppet. So that, that's for us, as we get more and more people um, excited about Puppet, that's one thing that I, I personally, I'm, it's in the back of my head. So one way to mitigate that is, is moving to a highly available architecture so that you can do upgrades, everything seamless. Um, but that won't solve all the problems, but you know, like syntax changing, et cetera. But um, I, I think with planning and having infrastructure that's highly available, I think you can mitigate some of that. But, but change is really hard, especially for a fast moving, rapidly changing software platform. Yeah, and I think it comes back to having that mindset of, of um, the, the whole point of the automation is to allow you to, to do that rapid evolution. So um, to, it's difficult when you paint yourself in a corner a little bit, right? Like you, you get everything out there yeah. and um, you're like, okay, duh, job done. And, but no, it's, it's a continual process of, of going, okay, what's changed, what's updated? Um, you know, we, we have a situation now where we have a platform that's running open source uh, 2.7 that we're trying to get up to, uh, you know, uh, PE 3.8 um, and beyond. Um, what, what we have found valuable is, um, and someone from Puppet will owe me a beer for this, is uh, leverage Puppet professional services, because they can, they can look and go, okay, where, where are your trouble modules gonna be? You know, where, where should you really spend your time going, here's your big likely gotchas, and here's the ones that you can maybe rewrite, uh, you know, and call it a refactor, you know, and use it as an opportunity to plumb that code base a little bit. Um, because if you don't, then you're just creating another legacy problem. Um, so there, you know, there is value to uh, whether you need to sell that to product managers or executive staff or your own team to take the time to do that. It's like any other op upgrade operation where you, if you just leave it alone, then skills are stagnating, your versions are getting behind, and you're going to have all those same attendant problems. I mean, I think one of the easier things that makes it happen is when Puppet puts out really great new features that are only available in new versions. Like we're on 3.8 and I haven't done the testing to see what going to 2015 is going to be like and I'm going to do it soon because I know how much our application teams want that app orchestrator and I don't want them to have to wait for it. Um, I want to be able to send them out in like the keynote and other information on and have them get excited and people's excitement will die down as time goes on. So I need to make sure that if I send them stuff I'm going to deliver and give them that new version. and. The answer is not going to be, I mean, personally, I wouldn't, sorry, personally, I wouldn't um, say we're going to upgrade part of our environment to 2015 and leave some on 3.8. It's going to be, we're going to 2015, we've got some great new features, we'll do everything we can to make it as painless as possible. Like Luke said, upgrades should be zero effort, and that's the goal. So I'm assuming that Puppet will help me with this. Um, historically, people are not ready for quick changes in, in our environment. They, upgrades do not happen every month. They happen maybe once a year. 
Um, so this is a brand new paradigm for us. And when I, when I upgraded from 3.3 to 3.7, and then they're like, oh, 3.8 just came out? I'm like, yeah, and I'm going to upgrade to it. And they're like, if they keep doing it, this is just so fast. And I'm like, yes, but there are reasons for that. Um, and Puppet isn't the only company doing that. So it, it's every, they're going to have to get used to it. All these companies are moving to incremental software upgrades that happen rapidly. Um, so you're in a, <laughs> that's, a tough, that's a tough situation, though, on the... 2.7 lagging. I mean, I, if it were me, I would probably say there are a lot of great features in 3 that you didn't have in 2.7, including stability. And, right. you know, but it's hard because they're like, I, I like what I know and I want to stick with what I think is safe. And that's it's hard. A issue. Oh, and that's true too. So yeah, the absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, so got it. They are truly legacy yeah. stuff and resource, you know, yep. we get resources from the business units yep. and explain to business units why something that works has to change because an automation tool version change yep. does not seem to have a value add to that. And I, I completely see that. I mean we, we I was one of the people who raised my hand for still having servers on rel four. We do have some and um, we have other enterprise software that does not run on RHEL 6, and we're going to be rolling out RHEL 7 soon, and you know, we want to get rid of the RHEL 5 boxes too. Um, and when you've got you know, enterprise software that has a very specific version that it runs on, then yeah, you're absolutely right. So that's, that's tough, and the resources are always constrained. So. Yes. Yep. And, um, and that's the hardest part because you, you, you hear somebody who's trying and then you pull the rug out from under them again. And, and even if it means no change to them, it feels like the rug got pulled out. Right. That's and, absolutely uh, true. And, and I know it's, hey, that's the world we live in now. Uh, but for somebody who's been a network guy for the last 25 years, yep. 30 mm -hmm. years, and he knows his stuff. Mm -hmm. Get off of my stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know. Eventually, attrition will occur. <laughs> Eventually. <laughs> um, and that can be a, take yeah. a very long time. I mean, that is one thing. I know with Puppet Masters, and I can't say how far back they support, but they do support older agents. So I wouldn't, this is just me personally, I won't speak for you know the Puppet experts um, who work at Puppet Labs, but I would keep moving the infrastructure forward. And eventually, it will take a, quite a while before, I mean, I, I think that even, I, I don't want to speak for it, but I think very old agents are supported with very new masters. So in that case, at least, you know, run it, or run it in no-op if you have to for a little bit just to see what the changes would be. But, um, but I, I would hope that you wouldn't have to keep your puppet infrastructure back because of a couple of stragglers. And, and to your point about the cultural change, it's, it's that comes into what we were talking about earlier. You know, we definitely had you know some uh, issues with people not wanting to change, and, and it's um, it's especially for someone who's got a lot of experience and is that guru, and they have one way of working, and now you're like, well, now you're a noob. You know, you're starting over again, and and that can be that's almost the worst, right? Because it's it's you've gone from the expert to you don't know anything, and that's you know. For anyone in this room, that's a hard uh, transition to make, especially professionally. But the, on the other side of the table, legacy tools are legacy skills. So if you want to keep relevant, if you want to keep that guru status, keep moving forward. And there is a benefit to you personally to do that. You know, so, so you know, it's, it's a lot of that same company culture, personal culture, you know, kind of management drivers is, and 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 then in those personal incentives. If you can get those aligned, that you know will go a long way for you get, being able to make some progress. And just to add on to that, those gurus are the people that if you can get them on your side, they'll be the best evangelist for you going forward. I mean, I can identify those people in my company who are like, these are going to be the hard people to convince, but if I can convince them, I've got, you know, 10 other people that, that, will, that will come along with them. So sometimes it can be hard to figure out. Every person has his or her own, like, touch point of pain that might be able to be solved by Puppet if you can just find it. But it can be hard. It's like a treasure hunt. I hope that was helpful. Yeah. That question back here in the back. Yeah. 
So, so right now we, we can't say that we have highly available puppet services. We have one in dev, QC, and production. But if we perform an upgrade, it will be offline for a certain amount of time. So we're still trying to solve that problem. Um, one way we're trying to do is trying to um, move our puppet masters to Amazon. And then if you move it to Amazon, then we can run a new stack in parallel with the old stack. And then when we've tested it, we can shut down the old stack and then just say, this is now the new stack. Uh, but, but we're still trying to solve that problem. Yeah, well, what we did is uh, we have multiple masters for multiple data centers. So we, the same way we have redundancy, uh, we do the same thing with our puppet masters and just manage the code that way and manage any big upgrades that way. What do you mean by, do you mean the certificate authority? Yeah. Oh, okay, so we have a central certificate authority database console. We are doing a split install. Those are not redundant, um, although it sounds like with some of the new features like PuppetDB being able to be redundant, that's gonna be helped a lot because the main reason why the database and console aren't redundant in my understanding is Postgres. So once that's solved, that should help a lot. Um, so we have um, one certificate authority in production and we have one in our test environment and we actually seeded the production certificate authority with the test um, certificate authority's keys so that, um, so that they can, nodes can go back and forth between them if necessary. Um, and our compile masters are just behind a load balancer. Um, so truthfully, our nodes are talking to the compile masters and not to the certificate authority. Um, although it is, M Collective is going through the certificate authority because M Collective is a whole different beast. But, um, so the masters aren't the problem. It's the central, it's the central infrastructure that's the problem. And there's currently there's no way around it. We had to take downtime if we upgrade the infrastructure. But because Puppet is very good about, um, we use cache catalogs. I mean, we don't rely on it. But if we upgrade the central infrastructure and it's down, it's not like our nodes. They might complain a little bit, but it's not like they break or the configuration changes or anything like that. It's just we can't make configuration changes or fix drift or anything until the central infrastructure is back up. So it's really for our customers, it's a minimal impact. Um, however, if we had more people doing development and stuff like that, obviously it would be a downtime for them. Um, we're not quite at that point. So. And I can, I'm going to break out of my moderator role for a minute. Uh, I have just a little bit of insight into the. Uh, the roadmap. Uh, so HA is going to be a very high priority in the uh, 2016 series. So yeah. Yeah. stay tuned. <laughs> um, one other thing for, for DR, we're just um, replicating. So we're just doing a replicated LUN across um, for our, to our secondary data center for DR. Um, so we're not, at, we don't actually have like the CA, two CAs up at once. It's just, it's either in one data center or in the other data center. So that's not really HA, but I don't know if that'd be interesting. Uh, it kind of depends on which platform it is and how it's managed. We have different <laughs> we didn't ha we have we have different life cycles. We have we have platforms that have multiple deploys a day, and we have uh, legacy mainframe systems. So it, uh, most of those changes are going through change control. For us, we have mixed hybrid. We the compliance things, we we change immediately the drifts. Um, so even that that idea, we had to run that through information security internal audit because we are a change ticket based uh, company. So uh, changing the drifts automatically, that's a new thing. And people were afraid of what that might cost. So our position was the person who changed that configuration from into a new one introduced the drift. We're just setting it back to the original <laughs> configuration. No, no. That's a great so idea. We're, we're just uh, <laughs> making sure that we enforce the configuration settings. I mean, we have, we have plans to integrate with our ticketing system that we haven't really implemented yet, so we, we probably should be. Um, truthfully, we don't, our servers are actually very static, so we don't actually have that much drift. Mostly what happens is somebody goes and makes a change they're not supposed to and Puppet puts it back. So ideally that person would have a ticket, or maybe it was something they were supposed to and they'll have a ticket. If Puppet puts it back, then they contact me and they say, why did Puppet do that? And I explain to them how they should have put that change in. So they actually already have a ticket, a manual ticket. but. Ideally, I would say ideally, there should be either a break fix ticket or 
uh, I wouldn't say a change control because a change control is something you do ahead of time. So some some notify. I mean, we get notification that a change has happened um, through through just reporting, but. Um, yeah, it should be. In, it's good to integrate with your other enterprise tools that you probably already have in place. Have you considered uh, tying tying it into payroll, where automatically uh, you could just you know, dock pay based on uh, <laughs> not, yeah, things that have to be reviewed? <laughs> when you talk about enterprise systems, I just I hadn't thought about that. I think it's going to be That's brilliant. Awesome, yeah. We'll look yeah. at that next year too. Absolutely. One last question. So for us, it's uh, set, we have multiple teams managing Puppet. So um, the key takeaways is transparent processes. So these are the steps for you to get there. And then uh, people can inspect our Git repository so they can look at other people's code. And then finally, there is a checkpoint at the end we're in. Before we deploy, there is a, our gurus just make sure that everything is good before we say, yep, good to go. We, we deploy to production or to, the, to our environments. So um, manual code. Yep. And communities of practice, like, hey, this is a good way of doing it, et cetera, et cetera. And we don't actually do that yet, but I have plans. I have great plans for that. And the way that I sort of look at it is you look at it any development um, company would do. So before you have a bunch of groups doing it, or I don't want to speak for you, but you, it's, it seems like the most efficient way to do that is with a, a full continuous integration setup. So you'll have your. Um, like I was at a bamboo talk because we actually have bamboo in our company and um, we're, we're gonna be testing it out. So that was really useful for me because um, he was talking about spinning up, you know, spinning up Vagrant or AWS instances to do the testing and then breaking them down so that that's, that's where you can get some, um, some trust in code even if you didn't write it. Um, I do think there is a place absolutely for peer review, for manual peer review and I think um, personally, it would be within my group. So even if there were other groups that were doing code, we'd still want to do at least an I, even if it passes all the all the tests, we'd still want to do an eyes on for the you know security vulnerabilities, things like that, where the continuous test integration tests are probably not going to catch you know human configuration issues like that. Um, so I mean, yeah, I, I treat it like like good development practices, um, even if you're talking about infrastructure. Yeah, the, the user groups that w we talked about initially at the beginning of the talk, the, um, those were very informal and were just like, hey, whatever is cool that we want to talk about Puppet, share some ideas. But now that there's actually code in motion and people are do writing modules, uh, they organically have started doing code reviews. And, so, uh, and, and we make sure that everyone has access to that repository. Um, for the multiple repositories that uh, that are needed, and um, that really fosters, you know. So we, like I said, we've got different infrastructure teams, runtime teams, uh, you know, people that have different responsibilities for different stack levels of the stack, um, but really bringing them together so it's a unified process. So anything that touches any Puppet code goes through that same group of people who know what Puppet can, code can do, know, you know, how risky it can be, and how, you know, make sure that okay, you're not going to throw something out there that's going to crush you know, half the systems that I run, um, that is a huge thing. And that that fosters that, that trust. And it, like I said, the, they're building that community themselves now. So it's, it's not even something that we have to enforce from a management level. So we can do one more quick question. So the, that code review process, have you formalized that? Will you do it weekly? I mean, could that, it sounds like it could be, unless you have people, you know, everybody has a day job, I guess, is, is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And everybody's so busy all the time. No, it's it's uh, it's more informal than that now. But because they're meeting twice a week, it's rel it's quickly enough that they can go, hey, I need someone to look at this, check this out. Um, you know, please let me know that I'm not going to break you. Or, you know, even, again, because we're still relatively new, there's you know there's a lot of people that are like, hey, I need another set of eyes on this so I can know what I'm doing. 
Um, and, and that's part of the, uh, you know, the incentivized training of like, hey, if you start doing this in a good best practices standpoint, then yeah, you're gonna get more. But to that point, um, in integrating with change control and, and bringing some of those agile and um, uh, best practices to the, the infrastructure team is definitely something we want to do. It, it helped for us that we had regularly scheduled meetings and to have people there. And then once we started asking questions, and some of them are re really basic questions, people got more comfortable that, hey, I, I'm not the only person who doesn't know anything about it. So that, and then now we don't have to do it. And, and to Jess's point, they're now doing it organically, uh, having regular code reviews. And it, with, with the previous group that I worked with, that, that became our change control, where we started looking at the diffs, um, and we were doing that on daily change control. Uh, you know, we would have a release page for, it, you know, for any system change that was going in, and it was literally just get diffs, and we would all look at it as a team daily, and that was the sign off. Yeah, we're looking at doing release management as a subsidiary to change control, but weekly may not be responsive enough. And I think to that extent, there should be something probably put into, I guess, my personal job description, setting aside time for things like code review as we roll it out to other groups, because there needs to be an expectation that somebody's going to do it. And if it's hopefully not just me, because you don't want to be a bottleneck, but you know, maybe it will be that for system engineers or, or other people who are the experts on it, that they will have 10% of their time doing code review for other groups. And then as those groups become more um, advanced, they should have their own code review people. And then the code review people should have their own little you know, user group um, sort of thing to get together to make sure you set the proper standards. Like this is the template we're using. Everybody does our spec test. Um, make sure that you follow these practices, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it should grow out. You don't want to just keep it in like with one person who's then, I don't want to do 50% code review. That would be boring. Um, so, but it's, um, it's an interesting question. You don't expect, I didn't expect, you know, as a, as a system administrator at heart, I didn't expect to be doing code review, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, Absolutely. And, and I know it's really cool of trade off question. So now that we have, we have an issue with um, where the actual configuration is a, is a trade secret, I mean, if you, if you basically specify what the, what the configuration is, you're implying for how the process works and, mm. and everything. So in an open code review, you know, some people might not want to share their, their configuration with other teams. Oh. I never really thought of that. I Correct. mean, definitely to the forge, I could see that for us, but we're smaller than these other. Correct. So, so for us, we had this concept of separation of duties, <laughs> so that a database administrator can't look at something. Uh -huh. So we we're still we're still trying to figure that out. How how to do code reviews while still maintaining the separation of duties? I'm more for breaking down the separation of duties. Or our internal yeah. audit says no separation of duties. So I'm just saying, an administrator, or an engineer is an engineer is an engineer. There's no Unix admin, there's no DBA admin, there's no storage admin. So, so yeah, that's still, that's still a problem. The other thing is putting things into Hira as much as you can. So if they have passwords, for example, and they don't want me to know their passwords, I don't want to know their passwords either. Yeah. Um, so put it into Hira in an encrypted form where I only see it like, I mean, yeah, I have the keys, but I don't look at it unless I absolutely need to or something. Um, we also have other restrictions as a financial company around access and not, so um, I think that helps with that as well. Yeah, there's, there's plenty of ways to give people read access into a repository, and there, there really shouldn't be anything other than passwords or anything that would prevent somebody from a dev, dev team looking at ops code or, or you know, infrastructure code and vice versa. Um, and really, you know, coming back to the DevOps thing, that fosters you know, that understanding that those are wholly dependent. Production runtime is production runtime. Everybody's got to play nicely and understand the full stack to really get a full, trustable stack. So that it, it's one way to work around that and foster that from within a company. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate all the questions here. Uh, we've Good got to wrap it up. Elise, Peter, Jez, thank you so much for taking your time. Thanks, Good questions. Thank you. Thank you.